welcome to a special edition of the Why Parliament Works podcast, ahead of the first new session of Parliament since the United Kingdom left the European Union. To mark the occasion and to celebrate the forthcoming Queen's speech, which will set out the government's plans to build back better from the pandemic and level up opportunities across the country, I'm joined by Daniel Hannan, Lord Hannan of King's Clare, who was a very distinguished member of the European Parliament, one of the most prominent Eurosceptics, with whom I agree on many things, and is now a member of the House of Lords. Daniel, my Lord Hannan, thank you for coming on to the podcast. But this is not any ordinary podcast. This is a special episode because it was suggested to me that the tables should be turned and that this week's guest might in fact become the interviewer. So Daniel, over to you. Well, thank you, Jacob, and thanks for for inviting me uh, into this august position. I'd like to begin with the theme of your lecture uh, earlier this year and the importance of Parliament. You've always been an advocate and an apostle of British exceptionalism. I wonder whether you could set out whether you think that that rests to some degree on the importance and centrality of Parliament in our national story and if this is something that sets us apart from neighbouring countries. Yes, I think it does. I think... It's very interesting looking at the history of Parliament, going all the way back to 1265, how remarkably uh, responsive to the political nation and to the desires of the English and then the British people Parliament has been. Um, If you go to the early 14th century and you look at the petitions that are being brought forward, they're not just brought forward by the great and the good, they are brought forward by other people, people who have interests in the way their lives are being ruled, from at that point a relatively remote Westminster. And this continuous um, knowledge of what the country thinks, what the nation as a whole wants, has given us a great strength and a great stability. And when you look at economic performance and constitutional settlements, I think you come to the conclusion that they are intertwined, that you need for prosperity freedom of speech, uh, the rule of law, a representative parliament um, and the rights of property. And parliament has been absolutely the core of that as the defenders of the rights of property but also the safety valve for the expression of opinion and the ultimate lawgiver. Now I'm a great admirer of the American Constitution. I think it is a beautiful document, incredibly carefully um, crafted, but it has one big problem and that is that ultimately the law is made by the judges because the constitution is so difficult to change. In this country ultimately the law is made by members of parliament, realistically members of the House of Commons. And this can sometimes allow things to be changed too quickly and things to be done which aren't fully thought through but it is always responsive to the electorate and that embeds our system in a stability that has allowed for our prosperity. And when you look at our friends on the continent, it is extraordinary to think that Spain had a coup in our lifetimes. Um, uh, France had a coup just before our lifetimes. Even countries that you think of as being stable have had this extraordinarily volatile constitutional settlement. So let me me draw you on that, if I may. I mean, it's certainly, I think, the case that the big landmark events in our history have often been experienced as parliamentary events. The Reformation, the Civil War, the Glorious Revolution, indeed even entry uh, into and then exit from the European Union. The, there was a centrality uh, to Parliament in that story. But to what extent do you think... I mean, that you, I, I wonder whether people watching this from Europe might say, well, what's so special about that? We're also constitutional law-based democracies... Uh, you know, it, it, it isn't this a, a sort of uh, a fantasy that the British imagine that they're different from everyone else when in fact they are just another uh, Western liberal state? It, it, your point on the parliamentary centrality is an absolutely fascinating one. Um, Henry VIII is probably our most tyrannical ruler. He executes during his reign 2% of the population. I mean, he is a monster by most... Um, standards. And yet, he decides that the biggest reform he does should be done through a parliamentary mechanism. And you think, why was that? Why has this thread run through our constitution for hundreds of years? 
why did even our most tyrannical ruler feel that using Parliament was necessary? And I think this is about binding the whole nation together. And I've always been impressed, and I referred to this in, in the talk I gave earlier this year, by Sir John Fortescue, who sets out English exceptionalism, because that time it is the King of England, the crowns haven't been united, in the 15th century. And his key point is that the King of England is under the law, whereas the King of France is the law. And that is a fundamentally different constitutional approach. And actually, I think when you look at our difficult experience in the European Union, this different understanding of law was fundamental to it because the European state is the law. It is the highest form of law. It is, in their view, the noblest form of law, and nothing can possibly be above it. Whereas in our country, everybody is equal um, under the law, including the state. Yes. Now, I mean, you, you, you're, you made a lot of John Fortescue and his, his distinction between uh, France, for which read Europe in his time, I mean, the, the other is the, the place where the word of the prince could take off a man's head, uh, and Britain, or England as it then was, uh, which was, as he put it, a, a dominion politicum at, at regale, that the, 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 the was above the, the sovereign was something even greater. I wonder, though, whether we are living too much in the past. Our critics would say, well, that, that may well have been true. It may well be that Britain evolved these constitutional, England and then Britain evolved these constitutional liberties earlier than many continental countries. Uh, but isn't it now the case that we are all law governed? Uh, I mean, you, in, that, in that same address, you, you referred to uh, the, the wonderful book, Why Nations Fail, uh, Atomoglu and, and Robinson. And, and of course, they, this is the central part of their thesis, that uh, the ability of a government to make up the law as it goes along is, is what defines a, a poor and failed state, and uh, the rule of law is what defines a successful one. I mean, if you were Dutch or Danish or indeed, you know, Lithuanian, wouldn't you say, what, well, that, that, thank you very much for what you did for us earlier, Britain, but, uh, but don't still hold this over us? Well, in some ways, time will tell. And the question is, do we use the freedoms that we have gained from leaving the European Union? To what extent Will we be tied into um, following them or feeling that we ought to follow them or following other international law and guidance giving bodies? That, that is a choice that we have to make. But why should it help us now? I think it should help us now because of the political sensitivity of our system, which I think we should be very proud of. I mean, I think it is very remarkable that in this uh, country, most members of parliament have a weekly constituency surgery. So say it's on a Saturday and somebody comes to see you and raises an important point. As a newly elected backbench MP, if it's important enough, you can raise that with the head of government on Wednesday. And that's phenomenal because it means you cut through all the layers that are there to protect leaders from having to deal with the uh, routine problems of daily life for the people that they are supposed to rule. That it is a direct democracy that I just don't think you see in the same way in other countries, and you certainly don't see in the European Union. Now, why is this important? Well, when laws go wrong, when they are unfair, when they impinge upon people in an unduly onerous way, you notice it not in broad statistics, which come years too late to be of any help to you. You notice it because an individual has come to see you and said, this is unfair. And you go to the House of Commons and you say, this has happened and this is unfair, and you suddenly discover, that a hundred other MPs agree with you, and the same thing is being received by them. And I mean, you were a member of the European Parliament, you were a member of, for a long time. Indeed, you once tried to persuade me that I should become a member of the European Parliament, but I thought once they'd got you, they couldn't, um, <laughs> they couldn't do better than the best, and therefore there was no point in my jogging along as well. Um, but you couldn't do that, because even if your constituents came to you, you didn't have that ability to challenge the people who were actually ruling to say to them, this law needs to be changed. And one of the great failings of the European Union is the difficulty in changing laws once they've been introduced. No, I, well, you see, I, I do think, on the basis of that experience, that Parliament does have a peculiar centrality here. Uh, Enoch Powell once said, Parliament is a word of magic and power in this country. And it is certainly the case that the European Parliament modelled on 
if you like, the continental norm. It would have been very familiar to a Spanish or a French MEP, semicircular chamber, fairly weak institution, subordinate to the executive, uh, not really except in the loosest way constraining the government. But I just want to draw you, before we come on to the, the specifics of, uh, of what Brexit means for, for Parliament, a little bit more on the context. Um, you, you've set out very eloquently, very powerfully, this idea of uh, an almost sort of providential story of, of British success and the rule of law and the spread of freedom and personal autonomy and, and all the rest of it. And as you say, Parliament was involved from the beginning. It, it's uh, uh, Henry VIII made sure that the political nation was involved uh, in, the, in the break with Rome. And that just leads me to, to wonder, because I, I've also heard you say that on moral matters you take your whip from Rome. Have you ever felt a tug of contradiction between this exceptionalist patriotic Whig history and, at least on some matters, taking your whip from Rome? Because a lot of traditional Whig historians would have seen the, the centrality of Protestantism as a very big part of the story. Uh, yeah, indeed, they would. Um, but I think if you look at our history, there are many occasions when it almost went wrong. So I don't see the fact that the UK has had such a successful thousand years as being divine providence of either a Protestant God or a Papist God, um, or of a God who actually can cope with both sides of the argument. It, it is a lot of fortunate happenstances where most of the time the executive didn't want to give more power to Parliament but it found it necessary and convenient to achieve its objective and this actually goes right back to Simon de Montfort and 1265 Parliament. Simon de Montfort doesn't bring the burghers in from towns because he's a Democrat. He brings them in because they solve an immediate political difficulty. Henry VIII doesn't legislate through Parliament because um, He's a Democrat and he thinks this is a great thing to do, but because there's been uh, various types of rebellion, there's been the pilgrimage of grace, he knows that if he is to make this work, he needs to um, dip people's hands in the blood. And therefore, he needs to get people who are influential in their own communities involved with it and supporting it and enforcing it. Um, it almost goes wrong uh, in all sorts of directions in the middle of the 17th century. Uh, I mean, um, Charles I goes wrong and Cromwell goes even more wrong uh, in, in his way and in the dictatorship that he sets up. We're then very lucky in 1689, not because we're getting um, Protestant good King Billy back, because bear in mind that after the Battle of the Boyne, the Holy Father has a tedium sung in St. Peter's in celebration of William of Orange's victory, but because it ensures that we become parliamentary rather than an absolutist monarchy. We then are incredibly lucky in the 18th century that your average English aristocrat wants to be in the equivalent of Somerset. He wants to be in his home base, not in London, whereas the system Louis XIV has set up means that all the aristocracy are around him and his successors in Versailles, and therefore completely losing touch with what the nation at large wants. So there are all sorts of things that happen by good fortune, good luck, that could easily have gone wrong and we could have had a very different history. But yes. interestingly, Parliament is continually central to it and it is that link to understanding what the people want. Yes, actually Linda Colley in one of her books makes the, the point that the, the relative weakness of the English and British monarchies at that time can be inferred from the, uh, the limited palaces that compared that there were Versailles all over Europe, the, in, in St. Petersburg, in Madrid, and Naples, and so on. Uh, whereas there was a, a wonderful um, episode when, um, uh, when a, a developer built a block of flats overlooking the garden in Buckingham Palace. He advertised the flats on the basis that you'd be able to watch the king exercising in the garden. Uh, and King George petitioned Parliament and said, this is really outrageous. And Parliament said, well, it's property rights, uh, Your Majesty. You know, if you don't like it, you buy them. And, and that, was, that was, would have been, I think, almost literally unthinkable. But just, just final point on this. Coming back to your, the distinction you drew about, you know, between the, the, the British and American constitutional settlements. 
I mean, the, the, the Bill of Rights was of central importance in, in both parts of the then united uh, polity. But I think it was understood in importantly different ways that in Great Britain, the Bill of Rights was seen above all as a guarantor of the supremacy of Parliament, whereas in the colonies it was seen as a guarantor of the supremacy of the law. And that may seem a small thing, but of course it was to have immense consequences in the 1760s and 1770s uh, when the, the, the issue of, uh, of parliamentary supremacy uh, came into the, uh, the hazard. Um, I, just, uh, I just wonder whether, um, uh, as we now look forward you know, to, if you like, a full restoration of, of parliamentary sovereignty, whether you see that as bringing again a certain exceptionalism to this country and these buildings? Well, I think it does almost automatically. Now, there is the challenge as to will the government use the powers, and I'm confident that this government will, but you never know about future governments. But I think it changes the terms of trade. There has been, in recent decades, some contention between the judges and politicians in a way that there never used to be. And I think that was deeply rooted in our European experiment because there suddenly you had law that was superior to Parliament, which you'd never had before. And therefore that opened the way for the judges to say, well, um, this law hasn't been properly made or this law has come from a high author authority and overrules what is decided in Parliament. That's now switched that the highest law-giving body in the United Kingdom is Parliament. And whether we boast about that, whether we shout it from the hilltops or not, that is now the fact. And that has changed our relationship with the courts uh, purely by the fact that we have left the European Union. And I think bodes for a much more settled and better relationship where both sides are doing their proper job. Part of it will happen because we are beginning to use the new freedoms. Why? because our constituents want us to. You see, it's wonderful. I mean, it, it is so exciting to be a politician in this age because when my constituents come to me and say, I don't like what you're doing, I can no longer hide behind the European Union and say, well, I'm very sorry. You must have heard the criticisms I have over these past four or five years who say, tell me one thing that we couldn't do in the European Union. Give me one advantage of, uh, of I mean, you, you, I, I wonder whether they were asleep during the referendum if they didn't hear any of the things. But, but, but from your vantage point uh, as leader of the House, what were we not able to do that we are now able to do? Well, we couldn't control our borders. Um, the Queen's speech has been trailed in advance. I'm not giving anything away and saying that the Queen's speech will include an announcement of a bill on our borders that will mean we properly control our borders and that we are able to run a fairer and better system that better looks after people in genuine need and discourages people traffickers. Uh, we're able to do trade deal deals with our friends around the world. Australia and New Zealand are in the midst of negotiation discussion now. That will have benefits directly for consumers. Every country in the world that has reduced tariffs has benefited. But on top of that, the good news is, in terms of financial services, we are already beginning to use our freedom to move back to a principles-based rather than box-ticking exercise of, of regulating. And that's very good news. But I think it comes from the bottom up. I think it will come from constituents getting in touch with their MPs saying, I can't do this. Or if I buy something from America, it costs me twice the price as if I buy it locally because there's a tax applied. And if the tax were removed, I'd be able to buy it for less. And so I think direct democracy has the effect of encouraging us to use our freedoms. But Parliament will see that it can use its freedoms as well. It, there's been very poor scrutiny of statutory instruments. I don't think I'm giving away any great secret by saying that. Slightly better in your house than in mine, but not great. Mainly because most statutory instruments didn't matter what we did because they re -U law Exactly. Anyway, and so, but, but this is the this is the the, uh, the the central point. One of the things, maybe the single most depressing thing for me after Brexit, was when a memo was circulated to various government departments saying, "What do you now regard as the most urgent legislative changes post 
withdrawal. And almost all of them said, we need an equivalent power to issue these statutory instruments and the, these forms of secondary legislation because the EU won't be doing it for us, which I just thought was, you know, I mean, who needs someone telling you what to do if that's your own attitude? But has Parliament given them that power? No. The 2-2 two -two power died. It is not there. And therefore, new regulations require a sponsoring act of Parliament and the secondary legislation to come through. And even within government in the last year, more attention has been paid to statutory instruments coming out from individual departments. They are getting a better internal scrutiny. And I notice the beginnings of better scrutiny in either house as well, that people recognize that they can stop something. They can vote yeah. it down. And this is obviously what Parliament is about. And suddenly statutory instruments become a bane of political contention in a way that they just could not be whilst we're a member of the EU. And members of Parliament actually quite like using the powers that they've got. Why? It becomes a campaign. It's something for the opposition to do. Um, you can bring together coalitions which will oppose a particular item. You can even win little victories if you're in opposition. Yes. So I think the structure of our Parliament will grow back to take charge of this. And I very much hope this happens as well, because I do feel at the moment we spend too much time on general debates and too little time on legislation. On detailed scrutiny, yes. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a, that's a very fair point. I just want to move on and ask you, Jacob, if you could... If you could, as it were, close your eyes and wish for one legislative change that is possible now, but that was impossible between uh, 1973 uh, and 2019, what would it be? Oh, it would be the trade issue. Yeah. Uh, that, that I think the greatest damage done to our economy was a protectionist system that meant that UK consumers imported expensive EU goods rather than cheaper goods from the rest of the world. The... Um, Free trade argument is always a difficult argument to win. Always has been. And it's fascinating that lobby groups always argue for protectionism, even though protectionism harms their industry in not just the long run, in the medium run it affects them because you build in inefficiencies. And you almost always end up with very significant structural change years later. But of course the default position for lobbyists is to argue for protection. They think it helps their industry and they ignore the fact that it undermines productivity, delays improvements and undermines, undercuts long-term profitability. So those of us who are in favour of free markets have to make the argument again and again and again that when the consumer is better off, everybody is better off. We are all, after all, consumers, but also you encourage uh, competitiveness and you make the high-quality producer even better, world-beating. And the leaving of the European Union means that we no longer as consumers have to subsidise inefficient continental manufacturing. And I think that's a really exciting it's opportunity. It's fascinating, isn't it, that uh, we can see already a reorientation of our trade to what I think you and I would regard as its global hinterland, it, it, the, 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 the market to which we're bound by habit and history and custom and kinship. Uh, and yet that is uniformly portrayed as a bad thing. Uh, the number of stories there have been in written and broadcast media saying this is how much our cross-channel trade has fallen, without any mention of the fact that our trade with everyone else is rising. That, that's exactly what was meant to happen. You could be against it or in favour of it, but that was always going to be the consequence of Brexit. It was a reorientation towards global markets. Uh, absolutely. And the biggest shift will be in our imports from the European Union, but because uh, we won't have to impose the punitive tariffs on people who produce the same goods more cheaply. Uh, Japanese cars are an obvious example. They're the agreement was coming in with Japan, but why on earth was there a 10.2% tariff on Japanese cars, which, apart from anything else, are usually produced with the steering wheel on the correct side. Yeah. And, and, and therefore, there was an automatic competitive advantage um, in the scale of Japanese production. But we made Japanese cars deliberately more expensive as opposed to German cars for no good reason at all other than to subsidise um, continental well, the same reason that we make, um, you know, we pay a 10.2% tariff on men's shirts imported from India. or I mean, it, you know, that, that, it, it, there are lots and lots of things that, lots that I hope will things. change soon. Um, final question, if I, if I may, Jacob. That's all very interesting. But I, I, want to, to, I want to broaden it a little bit, your role as, as leader of the House. There's some talk about whether 
there may be a broader constitutional uh, rejigging. Uh, a number of anomalies and excrescences and barnacles have kind of encrusted the Constitution. But I think this is very important. I think this is how our system works well, because nothing is supreme above a sovereign parliament. Therefore, and we saw this with the Fixed Term Parliament Act, ludicrous piece of legislation that, of course, could be overruled by another act of parliament. So it had a two-thirds majority for a general election to take place, which an act of parliament then said, well, actually, we're not taking any notice of that. We'll have an election anyway. And so there is a political cost. If the law's particularly stupid, the political cost is very low to operating outside the conventions but you have to maintain the ultimate convention, which is that the Parliament of the United Kingdom is sovereign and has a delegated sovereignty from the British people. That's why I disputed the European Union, because I thought the one power Parliament cannot give away is its own power, because that belongs to the British people, not to... But what about, what about if you just have a, a situation of sort of mounting silliness, such as uh, the unfinished reform of the Second Chamber, you know, uh, by which I don't mean unfinished since 1911. I, I mean more specifically unfinished since, since uh, the, the Blair removal of the hereditaries. Um, we've ended up with a situation that all sides promised at the end of the 1990s could not be allowed to, to remain, which was that the government would appoint whomever it wanted without really any check at all. So we, we have a situation that, you know, if it were happening in Burma or Zimbabwe or something, we would regard as uh, proof of authoritarianism, where... You know, the, the role of the legislature, as you were saying earlier, has historically been to check the executive, and yet we have the executive appointing one of the two chambers. Now, doesn't there come a point where these things just become indefensible, not because of a crisis or a war or anything, but just because uh, it, it's no long, it, it becomes so uh, risible that people say, Some, we need to change this? Uh, no, I don't agree with that. I think the arguments over the House of Lords which go back well before 1911, uh, are ever there, and they are affected by one fundamental problem, which is how do you reform the House of Lords without taking power away from the House of Commons? And therefore, how do you uh, make the undemocratic bit a bit better without undercutting the democratic bit? And nobody has yet managed to come up with a good answer to that, and therefore the House of Lords remained unreformed. But the House of Lords does a respectable job in saying that bills should be better written in scrutinising statutory instruments. There are some aspects where it gets a bit political, um, which isn't really its role. That's the job of the House of Commons. But those tensions are bound to exist. And you, you said not the unfinished business of 1911. Of course, um, a temporary measure until a better form of having a House of Lords is provided, as mentioned in the preamble. But that goes on until um, Harold Macmillan's introduction of the life peers in the late 1940s. 50s, having the opposite problem of the current one, that it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and fewer and fewer peers turn up and nothing much happens there. It gets sleepier and sleepier and the injection of life peers reinvigorates it. Now we've got a number of life peers of which I've lost count. Um, uh, but it's always been on prime ministerial or sovereign patronage. I don't think that's a particular problem because it's not the democratic house. It's the revising house. The democratic power is, is within the House of Commons. Um, if somebody comes up with a perfect reform of the House of Lords, I'm sure there will be interest in it. But I don't think you need to change our constitution fundamentally or codify it uh, to reform the House of Lords. Very good. Well, let's, uh, let's end on that wonderfully conservative note that inactivity and sleepiness may be virtues in a politician <laughs> and, and doing nothing very much may in fact be a, a worthy aspiration of a successful government in a prosperous country. Jacob, thank you very much for taking the time. Daniel, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure.